Hey everybody, it's Double M from the Touch Em Up podcast, and I've got some very exciting news. I'm thrilled to announce my partnership with BetStamp and Sign Up Expert. Now, you may be wondering what that is, but this is opening up an incredible opportunity for you to join some of my favorite sports books in order to get the best odds and new user offers depending on the event. Head over to my dedicated sign-up page, which I've linked in the description, at signupexpert.com slash touchemup. This will allow you to explore a selection of sports books tailor-made to your specific region without you having to do any additional work. So without any further ado, if you're ready to support the Touch Em Up podcast just one step further and also catapult your sports betting experience at the same time, make sure to follow my sign-up expert link that's posted in the description of this video whenever you sign up to a new sports book. And without any further ado, let's get today's video started. The WWF's second weekly show wasn't actually a weekly show during its original pilot episode. SmackDown kicked off as a take on The Rock's catchphrase about the SmackDown Hotel and laying the SmackDown. It would get a pilot episode in late April of 1999. However, it wasn't until late August of that same year that it would become the second weekly television show on Thursday night alongside Monday Night Raw. SmackDown was not really known for anything extremely memorable during its first year in 99. However, this video will discuss the debut year, not just the debut episode, of the Blue Brand in the World Wrestling Federation. The debut episode of SmackDown took place on August 26, 1999, and the blue brand would be ushered into network television with a stellar main event. A main event for the World Wrestling Federation Championship, where the champion in Hunter Hearst Helmsley put his belt on the line against the people's champion, the Brahma Bull, in The Rock, who at this point was slowly making his way towards becoming a full-fledged face, and not being known as the corporate champion, but being known as the people's champion, and everybody was behind The Rock at this point. The main event would consist of Triple H vs. The Rock, with Triple H's former partner in D-Generation X and the former commissioner of the World Wrestling Federation in Shawn Michaels being the special guest referee. And it would be Shawn Michaels who would cost The Rock the chance to win the championship after hitting a sweet chin music and allowing for Triple H to hit the pedigree and retain his championship. SmackDown 99 is kind of known as The Rock Show because of the catchphrases we mentioned earlier. However, I believe that SmackDown 1999 was truly ushering in the era of a superstar who was just beginning a successful singles career. A superstar who was a former member of D-Generation X in Hunter Hearst Helmsley, who would now become known as Triple H. Triple H's career as a singles competitor, but more so as a main eventer, truly kicked off towards the tail end of 99, going into the beginning of the new millennium, where Triple H would maintain the gold for much of the entire year in 2000. Much of the year would see Triple H going head-to-head -head with the chairman of the WWF and Vincent Kennedy McMahon. In 98 and 99, at least in the beginning of 99, it was mainly a situation where Stone Cold Steve Austin was the number one enemy. However, going into the end of 99 and into SmackDown's inception, Triple H was slowly but surely becoming the enemy of the chairman of the board. However, towards the tail end of 99, going into December's Armageddon pay-per-view, the McMahon-Helmsley era would truly kick off as Stephanie McMahon would align with Triple H, who would maintain the World Wrestling Federation Championship to end the year. And like I said, go into 2000, where he would have his most successful career in the World Wrestling Federation thus far, being a true main event superstar but we wouldn't get that without 1999. There was even a so-called trial of Triple H on the September 22nd, 99 episode of SmackDown, where Triple H would compete in five matches on one single episode and would have to win three out of those five matches to compete in the match for the World Wrestling Federation Championship at Unforgiven later on in the month. Triple H would take on Big Show in a chokeslam match coming up in a losing effort. He would also take on Kane in the Big Red Machine's favorite match, known as an Inferno match, and would only come up with a victory after Viscera and Midian attacked Kane and were able to set his hand on fire. He would then take on those two men in both Viscera and Midian in a two-on-one handicapped casket match and didn't come up with anything but defeat 
as The Undertaker was supposed to take on Triple H, but would be gone until later on in 2000, at least halfway through the year. He would beat Mankind in a boiler room brawl thanks to somebody who helped him that we were never able to figure out. And finally, he would beat The Rock in a Brahma bull rope match with the help of the now heel British Bulldog who played part as the special guest referee. Triple H would then go on to Unforgiven and win the World Wrestling Federation Championship in that match. When it comes to the leader of the Ministry of Darkness and The Undertaker, we wouldn't see much of him on SmackDown in 1999, at least in the form of in-ring competition. He would align alongside Big Show as a part of the Unholy Alliance, or as you could call him, Paul White, where they would win and lose the World Wrestling Federation Tag Team Championships a handful of times. However, the only reason the Unholy Alliance ever really occurred was because Undertaker was nursing an injury, which is part of the reason it would take him out of competition until his return as the American Badass in 2000. That's something I've covered on the channel before, however, it's always fun to look back at the fact that Big Show and The Undertaker were a heel tag team at the time when Undertaker was still a Lord of Darkness in a way. Speaking of The Undertaker and Big Show, the only Buried Alive match to ever take place on an episode of WWE Network Television took place on SmackDown in this year, where The Undertaker and Big Show would look to regain their World Wrestling Federation Tag Team Championships from the Rock and Sock Connection, and they would do so successfully after winning the Buried Alive match, which has become known as The Undertaker and Kane's so-called specialty. One of the biggest World Wrestling Federation debuts up until this point would also take place on the debut year of the Blue Brand, with Chris Jericho, WCW's former Lionheart, debuting towards the tail end of 99 heading into the new millennium. His first match would be against Road Dog on the Blue Brand where he would come up victorious, but that's definitely something that needed to be touched on in this video. On the same night as the trial of Triple H that we talked about earlier in the video, Jericho would compete against the world's most dangerous man, Ken Shamrock, alongside Curtis Hughes in a first blood match where Jericho would win in just under three minutes. This doesn't necessarily have any historical significance, but based on Jericho's choice of attire, it's pretty interesting and something I felt like we needed to include. One of Jericho's most heated rivals in WCW World Championship Wrestling would also debut in the World Wrestling Fetter... Wait a minute. It would be the cheap knockoff version of Bill Goldberg in Gilberg or Dwayne Gill who would compete for the World Wrestling Federation Championship on an episode of SmackDown in 1999 against Triple H. However, he would come up in a losing effort, but this just goes to show you how wild SmackDown in 99 was. And we can't forget about Al Snow battling Big Boss Man to get back his dog in a pepper on a pole match as well. SmackDown 99 was wild to say the least. I don't want you guys to think that this is a video that's bashing SmackDown in 99 or bashing the debut year of the blue brand in the World Wrestling Federation because there were some pretty great moments and some good matches, at least on paper. There was an eight-man Survivor Series elimination match that took place on the November 4th episode with D-Generation X taking on The Rock, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Kane, and Shane McMahon after the Texas Rattlesnake would take the final fall and cause D-Generation X to win heading into Survivor Series for that year after the Deadly Games Tournament in 98. And along with that, we had the Rock and Sock Connection losing the World Wrestling Federation Tag Team Championships to D-Generation X, or should we call them the New Age Outlaws, in Billy Gunn and the Road Dog on the September 23rd episode of SmackDown. And this is known as one of the best matches, aside from Triple H versus The Rock, that took place throughout the entire year of 99. And how can we forget the fact that the Terminator and one of the biggest stars at the time in Arnold Schwarzenegger showed up on the November 11th, 99 edition of the Blue Brands Network television show. He would show up and not only be introduced by the chairman of the board and Vincent Kennedy McMahon, but he would be given his own replica of the World Wrestling Federation Championship. This was huge at the time because of how big of a star the governor of California was at the current point. In the final part of this video, we'll talk about the fact how the chairman of the WWF and Vincent Kennedy McMahon 
actually became the World Wrestling Federation Champion on SmackDown. He not only won the Royal Rumble in 99 by screwing over Stone Cold Steve Austin, but it would be that same man who would stun the champion in Triple H and throw Vince McMahon into the cover allowing for his son in Shane to count the 1-2-3 and allowing Vincent Kennedy McMahon to not achieve his WrestleMania dreams but later on achieve the World Wrestling Federation Championship for the company that he owned. In summation, SmackDown's debut year wasn't perfect. There was a lot of problems, a lot of bad gimmick matches, but there was also a lot of good that fans seem to gloss over when reminiscing back on the Attitude Era. SmackDown is not remembered for its debut year, but it should be. Because without the inception of the blue brand, the entire history of the World Wrestling Federation, now known as World Wrestling Entertainment, would partially cease to exist in some way, shape, or form. I hope you guys enjoyed my video. I hope you guys enjoyed a look back at the debut of the blue brand. I'm your host, Double M, and I'm out. Have a good night, everybody.